All righty. Welcome to uh, the Lead Generation World uh, virtual conference. Um, thank you all for joining. I hope you ho hopefully you've enjoyed the first two um, uh, sessions. Um, we try to keep it sort of uh, short and sweet on a per day basis by having two or three sessions every day so that you can spend time um, with your daily uh, work routine as well. Um, but we've got a great session lined up uh, for you uh, to finish off today. Um, but before we get started, I do want to encourage you all to ask questions. Um, like I say uh, before every session, um, questions really are imperative to really getting the most out of our guests that are presenting. So feel free to do so. You can do it uh, via the uh, Zoom application here uh, in the QA, or if you're watching via our event uh, app on Whova, you can ask the questions there. But we'll, um, I'll make sure that I ask it for you at the end of the presentation, um, or if appropriate, I may interrupt them and ask him uh, the question then. But please do ask questions. It's really, uh, like I said, important to get the most out of our guests today. So um, I'm going to uh, hand it over to our first presenter today, Arthur St. Pair from Do Leads. He's the CEO, and, and Do Leads has been around for 14 years, uh, or just maybe 14 and a half years, and is an international company doing a lot of great things. Um, so I'm really happy to have Arthur participating in today's uh, conference. So Arthur, I'll hand it over to you and I'll let you take it from here. All right, excellent. Uh, let me share my screen. Can you just confirm you can see my screen, guys? Yeah? Yes. Yep. Right. Excellent. Hello, every uh, hello everyone. I hope you already had a great time attending uh, Lead Generation World. Uh, in London. Uh, so my name is Arthur Sinkir. I'm speaking from uh, Boston in the in the US uh, today. Thank you, Michael, for your uh, kind words and, and also for giving us the opportunity to uh, to speak today. Um, today we're going to cover the states of the lead generation industry at home and abroad. So at home means in the UK, and abroad means uh, both you know in the in North America, in the US, in Canada, but also in the rest of Europe. Um, and as a disclaimer, I'd like to start uh, by you know, remembering the, the audience that um, the lead gen industry is a hardly known industry. It's very hard to find numbers covering that industry. There is no true market research there, uh, no clear market sizing. And when you look at the, the, the usual suspects like you know, Foresters or Gartner, it's very hard to, to find uh, true data as far as, uh, as uh, lead generation. Uh, that said, we at, at Dooley, we gather a lot of data. We are an international company. We operate in 12 countries, both in, in the US and Canada, but also in uh, many, many countries in, in Europe. And, and of course, we talk frequently to, to our partners, to our clients, and even to some of our competitors. And the trends uh, I'll be sharing with you today are really reflecting what we believe happened over the past few months uh, during the pandemic, but also, um, you know, what will happen in the future, in the upcoming few, few years. Um, so let's, uh, let's start this. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's 2020, uh, sorry. Well, it's um, 2021. Uh, we, we made it to the other side. We almost made it to the other side. From a pure business perspective, I think that most uh, Legion companies saw the numbers uh, pick up after the, or during the summer last year. And uh, the last semester was, uh, was pretty strong for, uh, for everybody. I, I know that from a pure uh, you know, health perspective, uh, we're, we're not completely done with the virus. The, the vaccine is being rolled out in the, in the US. Uh, also in Europe, there is the, the new Indian variant in the UK that is a little threatening to, to everyone. Uh, but still, um, we, we we're much better off now than, than a year ago. If we remember where we stood you know, in March, May, March, April, May last year, I think everybody was uh, in, a, in, in, a, in a worse uh, situation. So the, the question, the big question for, for this session today is, you know, first, how fast will, will business be back to normal, uh, business as a whole, uh, the global economy, but also what does the new normal look like for the lead generation industry specifically? Um, I, I, I guess that's, that's the main thing we're going to try to cover today, and I will uh, and I will try to give you as, as much insights as, as possible in that re with that regard. Um, this is what we're going to cover today, uh, the session agenda. We're going to start with a, an outlook for a fast-growing industry, lead gen, I think, a fast-growing industry for 
over two decades now, and uh, we believe things are, are, are going to, to speed up a little bit in the, in the future. Uh, second topic, uh, you know, the, the changes that were implemented by the industry during the pandemic, both by lead vendors, but also by the brands, the end advertisers, and we're gonna we're gonna, gonna discuss if these changes uh, are for good or or not, or if they were just uh, um, you know um, they were just uh, trying to fix something for a very short uh, period of time. And then I will I will finish this presentation by sharing uh, with you guys the vision we have for the next three to five years for this industry. And um, uh, yeah, covering both the underlying uh, KPIs but also the, the, the changes that, that we see uh, being implemented with the industry. And I, would, I will wrap things up and then we'll move to our uh, panel, uh, panel of experts. I'm very happy to have both uh, Steve and, and Daniel uh, uh, here with us today uh, to have a little discussion. And again, don't hesitate to ask questions uh, using the, the Q&A box uh, within uh, Zoom. All right, and uh, yeah, to finish this presentation, so as Michael said, uh, I'm Arthur Saint-Pierre, I'm French, so my, my name is actually Arthur Saint-Pierre, but you know, Arthur Saint-Pierre works well. I'm the founder and CEO of Duli. This is a company I founded 14 years ago uh, in Paris. I'm now based in, in Boston in the US to cover the, the, the US market, and feel free to reach out uh, using my email there, uh, arthur at duli.com. Let's do this. First uh, section, outlook for a fast growing lead gen industry. So as I said, lead gen industry is a, is a hardly known industry. It's very hard to find numbers and, and even to define precisely what is lead gen. With Dulead, we usually consider that you know, online advertising is divided in three parts, branding, e-commerce, and what we call lead gen, or maybe we should name it lead commerce, the third part of, uh, of advertising. Um, so the first thing I have in mind when, when looking at the market is that um, I, I look into you know, the, the, the stock exchange uh, values. Um, this is something I guess everybody knows here uh, today when you look at the, the, the main three stock um, index in the US market, the, the NASDAQ, the Dow Jones and the S&P 500, you see two things. You see first that the, 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 the NASDAQ has been basically overperforming the rest of the pack for, for the past year or so, but also that uh, its current uh, valuation level are higher than pre-pandemic uh, at, at, at an all-time uh, high, actually. So this basically tells us that, you know, digital companies uh, are uh, probably much better off today than the typical brick and mortar uh, companies like the, the, the one covered by the Dow Jones uh, Industrial uh, Index, right? Another interesting fact here is the Queen Street stock. So Queen Street it's, uh, is a US-based company, probably the, the biggest lead gen companies uh, in the US. It's, uh, it's a public, uh, publicly traded company. And you see a trend that is actually similar to the NASDAQ trend, uh, a, a, big, a big dip in, in valuation in, in March last year and uh, then a strong recovery and even if the, the latest week ha haven't been so so great for for queen street you see that uh, the, the stock value is still much higher than, than pre-pandemic so i guess the, the the first insight we want to share with you today is that uh, uh, the the legion industry post-pandemic is up for a strong growth and this is one example to try to understand what are the underlying uh, KPIs to, to uh, map this out. Um, there is actually one um, piece of market research that we found online that uh, we found really interesting, uh, published by an m &A firm based uh, in Chicago named Colonnade. And they published two reports, one in 2019 and one in 2020, covering the Legion industry. Um, they claim that the market size in the US is 26 billion dollars, and this only covers um, the, the, the lead vendors, basically, the lead vendor uh, landscape, uh, growing very fast at a nearly 20% growth rate year, year over year when they compare 2019 versus 2018. 
And they also claim that 100% of the growth comes from digital. They, they break down the, the market value per channel. And they have two channels, digital and, and dark mail. And they say basically the digital is, uh, is, the, is what truly fuels um, the industry. Uh, we have other um, KPIs that are uh, worth mentioning. Uh, the average time spent per day with digital media has grown up by 15% in uh, 2020 uh, versus 2019, uh, plus 23 minutes average time spent per day on the five main social networks. Um, you know, this is mostly uh, US and, and Western Europe. And, and now you know, the mobile share of organic search and visits is over 60%. So we know that the users now they're browsing with their mobile device more than with their uh, classic you know, uh, traditional laptop. Uh, but you know, 26 billion is not really the size of the lead gen industry. It's, uh, it's a first, uh, it's a good first step, but it's not actually the, the true size because this doesn't count for the ad spend invested by the brands by the advertisers directly with uh, you know the the channels uh, they're working with, and this also don't really count the uh, non-ped uh, traffic they're getting from, from these channels, you know, the organic searches from, from Google, the organic SMO from Facebook or, or whatever. Um, so we've done our own market research there. We've been looking at the top 1,000 websites in the US. And what we found is that uh, roughly 30% of the advertising spend on Google is linked from, you know, uh, is linked to lead generation techniques or lead generation companies. So this is massive. Uh, we're probably talking about uh, 100 billion plus market size uh, worldwide there. And so this is, this is really, really big. And when you think about it, and when you look at the top industries in the US, education, insurance, finance, home services, telecom, B2B energy travel, you might think, okay, that makes sense. You know, we're, we're talking about very large uh, industries there, fueling their growth uh, by, you know, leveraging lead generation uh, techniques and lead generation marketing. Um, the fastest growing lead gen industries in Q2 2020, this is something I covered about a year ago, I, I did another market research, was, was really intriguing. We saw a lot of uh, online EU programs uh, scaling fast, some categories with the home services uh, industry uh, scaling fast because people obviously were sitting at home and uh, they were uh, not able to travel anymore. So they would probably spend some of their money to um, uh, within their, their home to make it better uh, and invest on, on, on some you know, um, stuff they, they wanted to, to change there, but also finance and insurance. And, uh, and I think of you know, uh, Medicare or fi final expense um, not very glamorous uh, categories, but still they, these categories uh, were on the rise uh, about a year ago. Now we see that things have gone uh, back to what we saw pre-pandemic. Uh, the usual suspects are, are uh, back on track and it's getting fast again, finance, insurance, home services, energy, energy is really back. Um, so the fastest growing lead gen industries in Q2 this year are, are, are the, the, the usual suspects. Uh, one last thing I'd like to mention right here is that, you know, lead gen is kind of the link between the online world and the offline and what happens offline when you look at the, at the sales funnel or the customer uh, journey, customer buying journey. <clears throat> A lead is really what links uh, an online experience with an offline experience. And, um, and all the companies who, which, you know, really need to fuel their sales team with um, <clears throat> high value uh, um, prospects, high intent prospects to generate sales at scale, uh, need to, to deliver uh, a properly lead generation uh, funnel for, uh, for their growth. Um, <clears throat> sorry about that, I'm losing my voice. Monday mornings. Um, another very interesting fact that I wanted to share with you today is that the digital advertising uh, as a whole is, is really growing fast. Um, and this is, this is worldwide uh, data shared by eMarketer. This, this comes from um, a July 2020 report. And you see here the forecast of the growth um, these guys see for the, the worldwide advertising uh, 
digital advertising spendings. Uh, plus 14, almost or plus 15%, 2019 versus 2018. And uh, the, the, the size of the spendings is, is meant to nearly double over the next uh, six years. So this is a true trend. This is something we, we, should, uh, we should keep in mind. And this, this is not just you know, Facebook or Google. This is a lot more, there's a, a, there are a lot more channels, third marketing channels that uh, a brand and, and lead vendors uh, could potentially look into. Um, I'm sure you've seen that, but TikTok announced about two weeks ago that they just released a lead gen, uh, a new lead gen feature for their uh, advertising partners to try and secure uh, leads from, from their platform. So lots of uh, initiative there. And if we, when we look at the breakdown, you know, looking at North America on one, one hand and Western Europe on the other hand, we see basically the same, the same trend uh, everywhere. So this is not just the US, this is also uh, uh, Europe. All right, so that was my first, uh, first section. Uh, now the, the question is, what changes have we seen over the past year? Uh, what type of um, new processes were implemented uh, with, with uh, the, the final and advertisers, the brands, but also the inventors? And, and can we capitalize uh, on this? Can we, can we try to use it to fuel the, the growth? So the first thing uh, I'd like to say here is that the, the, we, we see that this, this digital advertising spending uh, increase has been fueled by new consumer behaviors. Of course, the behaviors, they, they spend much more time online now than, than before. And they're also more entitled to use digital uh, apps or digital workflows to engage with uh, brands. We also see some temporary trends, especially in the U.S. You know, with the elections and, and some you know, budget uh, catch up at the end of the year. Uh, some, some brands had to really invest in the money they couldn't invest in, in Q2 by the end of the year. So we, we saw, um, we saw uh, budgets um, to you know, inflate a little bit by, by the end of the year. But, uh, but still, this has been fueled by new consumer behaviors. A um, few examples there, uh, you know, health tech. We, know, we now know that 48% of, of US doctors uh, have delivered virtual care after COVID versus 18% before. So that's a massive, massive shift for the industry. In France, we have Dr. Lib uh, doing really great to help consumers or, or patients you know, book their appointment with their doctors. Online education, I really believe online education is the next big thing for lead generation. Uh, the total market size is meant to grow uh, massively by 2024, adding another $247 billion in value uh, for that specific market. So this is something we, we should collectively look into uh, as an industry because this is going to be really massive. And another example is online entertainment that I'm sure you read already a lot about that. Disney Plus uh, took two months for Disney Plus to achieve what took uh, Netflix seven years. Uh, this is McKinsey uh, saying this. So the change in digital consumer habits is really here. And the question is how, how did the, the market and the lead gen companies adapt to it, especially the, the end brands? Uh, they had to face stores that were closed, call centers that were closed, especially in Europe, especially in North uh, Africa. Um, we know that some of the uh, voice operations are, are, are conducted through uh, companies that are located in North Africa but also door-to-door -door, uh, sales operations or you know, in-person at-home meetings uh, that were uh, hard to, to uh, run uh, during that, that period. So uh, the brands really had to adapt and adjust. And we saw with many, many of our clients, a global change of attitude towards you know, digital marketing as a whole, but also CRM, data analysis, MarTech investments, uh, lots of uh, changes there. Three examples. Uh, Cuisine Schmidt, the French company, they uh, sell a uh, kitchen in, in French and they, they uh, pre-pandemic, they did probably close to 100% of their sales through their stores, is now trying to uh, fuel their stores with uh, uh, appointments performed by uh, call centers, uh, fueled by digital marketing efforts. Uh, Intelsia, a call center based both in France and in Morocco, uh, had to rethink the way they work with their, uh, with their uh, executive or they, 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 their team because they, they just couldn't gather a thousand guys um, on one same place during the pandemic. 
So they had to invest on trainings and equipment for their sales force to be able to work from home. And ADT in the US, the largest uh, home security company, um, invested massively in testing new things um, uh, from, from a sales perspective, a sales process perspective, but also uh, a system perspective to have a, a better vision on what's happening both on the field uh, with the call centers, with the lead vendors, with their uh, resellers. Uh, that was really, really interesting. Um, so um, A players now embrace a new approach. Um, and I wanted to list a few things that were really, really interesting uh, to see out there on the market. The first one is the adoption of massive A-B testing tools. I've had a heavy discussion with, with our clients about, you know, how do you handle A-B testing? What tool do you use? What about chatbots? Is that, is that interesting? How do you make it work? Uh, because this is probably the next uh, big thing for us. Uh, the second trend is the acceleration of centralized databases. It was uh, really astonishing for us to see that even big companies had different databases for you know, the call centers, the, the, the field uh, sales, and, and some of their partners. So they tried to centralize everything. The, one of the best examples here I could think of is Vivint uh, leveraging Leadspadia, a SaaS, um, a SaaS uh, tool that helps you know, basically brands uh, deal with their different lead vendors at once and do their, their uh, budget optimization and arbitrage. Um, also the training and, and the onboarding of new, of new, uh, new team members. Uh, EDF, uh, now another French company dealing with solar panel, they, they basically asked uh, the, the field sales team to do the job of the, the inside sales team, basically the, the call center team and uh, with great success. So that was uh, really interesting for them to see that uh, that was that was working and that they might be willing to change something in the future to, um, to do an even better job there. And also, and also there is, a, there is that, that need for clear KPIs and clear targets. And, uh, and also um, dealing with clear KPIs and targets in, uh, in when, when everything is changing very fast. And, and again, the example of ADT was very refreshing with that, uh, that regards. Um, now, my last section would be the vision, and I'm no, and I know I, I'm running, I'm running a little uh, out of time there, uh, so I'm, I try to do my best to be very brief there. We think that um, there is a massive growth ahead, and that the, the the companies who will make the most of it will be the more the most sophistic, sophisticated, the most data driven, the most compliant. Um, we think that. These companies will leverage both internal marketing teams, but also performance marketing teams. And I'm going to get into this in a second. Uh, they will rethink the relationship with their lead vendors uh, to be more effective and to be more data driven again. And they will accelerate growth uh, using a 360 approach um, of, of their lead gen stack and try to automate stuff as much as they can. So. Uh, about rethinking the marketing team organization. Um, you know, the, the next gen, the next generation of marketing team organization will, will, will cover, will, will have two separate parts um, with, within the organization. The first, first part would, would be the, the internal marketing team, the team that has been there forever, right? Dealing with offline marketing, online marketing, whatever, but, but also the performance marketing team. Um, with, with many of my clients, I see that they, they don't uh, separate these two teams. It's basically the same guys dealing with, the, with these two streams of, lead, uh, of, lead, uh, of leads, which is probably not the best way to, um, to organize teams and, and to be focused uh, to deliver performance and, of course, customer generation. Um, so the first question then, when you have two different teams that you're working with internally, the internal marketing team, the performance marketing team is budget allocation. And I had a great conversation with a CMO saying, you know what, I really enjoy having my budget and looking into it every quarter and see how much I want to give to my internal marketing team versus my performance marketing team. It could really help uh, looking to the data and what's performing best and one, what needs to be done to, um, to generate the high growth with a, with a lower average customer acquisition cost. Um, then the second thing is that 
you need you need clear ways to do your your optimization trade-off. So maybe you need a tool like Expedia, like PX, like Cake. You have many uh, um, options on the table here, and you need KPIs, campaign ideas, performance ranking, uh, um, uh, and performance ranking uh, habits and, and tools. And also, you need to 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 know what what should be your customer acquisition cost, uh, your final KPI, the, the one that, that is probably the most important. And of course, to run your, your optimization trade-off, you need a clear data, uh, a good data collection uh, stream and a good analytics capabilities. Uh, you need to be able to do A-B testing, analysis, iterations uh, to get there and, and optimize everything at the campaign level. And last but not least, the branding and workflow. This is how you should probably rethink your relationship with lead vendors. Uh, what type of guidelines will, will you be able to share with your lead vendors? Do you have a standardized uh, document that you could share, especially when you are let lead vendors run branded or co-branded uh, marketing? Uh, what about compliance? Uh, you know, Jornaya, Active Prospects are great tools to help you uh, with that regard. And business reviews, make sh making sure that you, you talk to your lead vendors frequently, at least once a month, and that you, you both look into the data to, to understand what's really working well and what's not, uh, what's not working well. Um, to do so, uh, you need uh, the best uh, uh, lead generation marketing stack possible. And as I said before, the lead gen market is very, uh, it's, a, it's a, a hardly known uh, market, a hardly known industry, and it's hard to map out. So about a year ago, uh, we decided to try and map out the industry and we built that Leadscape 500 uh, landscape. And we decided to split all the different logos, 500 of them, both in the US and Western Europe, uh, within um, you know, the typical funnel, the gen funnel that a user might be facing. From traffic generation to lead capture through lead processing and then sales closing. These are the four main steps uh, when you look at the, at the at the funnel. And then you have um, companies right in between the channels and the brand and the advertisers, companies that might be lead vendors or SaaS products that could help you um, perform well when looking into both your internal marketing processes and your uh, performance marketing team uh, uh, operations. Um, so I'm going to cover this really quick. You have here to, to the top right, uh, top, um, top left hand of that uh, landscape, you see basically the, the lead vendors. You have the end-to-end -end operators, um, first party lead vendors, the typical publishers, third party lead vendors, the aggregators, affiliate marketing platforms, lead generation agencies, and what we call pen media leads as a service solutions, people like us, like MBF, uh, basically running only paid marketing effort to fuel your, your growth. Then you have uh, SaaS companies, softwares that you might be willing to test to um, create a, a better performing lead gen marketing stack. Media buying softwares, uh, email marketing softwares, landing page, A-B testing tools, webinars tools, chatbots, call tracking and recording tools, etc. And then as far as lead processing, lead distribution, we already named KPX with PDF, Lead compliance, lead validation, lead enrichment, lead scoring and nurturing, CRM and dialers, and, and also conversation intelligence. When, when a, a, a software records the, the calls and, and is able to produce, to share insights live uh, with uh, the, sales, uh, the sales team. And the last step is, you know, other external help that uh, might be worth uh, testing. Uh, you know, maybe ex externalizing your uh, sales uh, efforts through a call center, but also working with, you know, agencies like digital media buying agencies, email performance or growth hacking uh, agencies. Uh, so that was it. So the wrap up in, in, in uh, 10 seconds, uh, it's all about seizing the opportunity. We know that lead gen will stay on, on a fast track for the next years to come, fueled by changing digital consumer habits and digital ad spend trends. And companies that will seize this uh, unique growth opportunity will be better organized, more sophisticated, and truly da data driven and collaborative with their uh, lead vendors. Thank you very much. I, I did my best to do this in less than 25 minutes. 
uh, we'll hear from, uh, from our experts now. Uh, and I'm very happy to welcome uh, on stage Daniel Tobin. He is a Chief Revenue Officer with MVF, MVF Global, a company actually founded in London, I guess, uh, and, but also a truly international uh, company. Um, and Steve Rafferty. Steve is the founder and CEO of Active Prospects. He's based uh, in the US uh, on the West Coast. So thank you very much for joining us uh, today. I know it's very early for you. And, um, and let's do this. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I will start with my first question. Maybe Steve, you can just introduce yourself and, uh, and, and, and tell the audience uh, what is it exactly you are dealing with. Sure, uh, so my name is Steve Rafferty. Thanks for having me on this panel. And we're actually in, in Texas where I am uh, today, right in, the, right in the middle. Um, as far as Active Prospect, we're a consent-based marketing platform. And our mission is to make consent-based marketing the best channel for customer acquisition. So for any of you who are not familiar with the term consent-based marketing, it is the practice of only contacting consumers that have given their prior express written consent to be contacted. So we believe that this is the, uh, the best channel, uh, definitely for consumers, right? Because we're protecting consumer privacy and giving them control over their data. And uh, also should be the best channel for marketers as well. But it's, it's a channel that's got a lot of challenges. And so for us, what we're trying to do is make it the safest, most efficient, scalable channel for our customers by trying to address all those challenges. Everything from verifying and documenting consent with our trusted form product to handling the data integration between the buyers and the sellers to allowing uh, buyers to make real-time decisions on their leads uh, using any variety of data services that they want to really optimize their lead spend. So we uh, are primarily focused in the US as a lion's share of our market, but we have thousands of customers and we service customers worldwide. So you have a lot of data to share with us today. A lot sure. of insights on the trend there. Thank you. Uh, Daniel, could you introduce yourself, please? Hello, everyone. My name is Daniel Chabin. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer of uh, MVF. MVF is about a little over 11 years old now and was founded, um, as Arthur said, uh, in London. And MVF's uh, mission is to transform the way that businesses find new customers. And the way we're going to do that is by creating the world's most effective platform for customer acquisition. Now, what we do at MBF is we have a, um, a process that we call uh, smarter customer generation. And what that is, is we use uh, multi-channel marketing uh, techniques. So we run uh, activity on over 40 or 50 different channels. Uh, and we send leads through to our partners who then feedback uh, and we then optimize our marketing and our client sales process uh, to improve their results. And we do this, uh, we do this in an industry and territory agnostic way. So we generate leads for uh, lots of different products, any products we can think of, um, and in lots of different countries uh, all around the world as well. So. MBF uh, is over 100 million pound uh, annual revenue run rate at the moment. And we're in, we have offices in Austin, Texas, London, and uh, Groningen in, um, in Holland as well. Excellent. So again, lots of data, lots of, uh, uh, lots of insights uh, that will come from MBF uh, today. So let's start with the, the first question. Uh, uh, based on what you've seen lately, how would you describe uh, the, you know, the past pandemic uh, growth in, in lead generation. Maybe, maybe uh, Daniel, you want to start? So, I mean, for, for us, as I'm sure, you know, as, as is the experience of lots of people who, who, who are watching this as well, um, around April time was, uh, you know, very unsettling time for a lot of people and you know and, and we didn't know how many companies would continue trading and, and and where the revenue would go but you know fundamentally what um as lead generators we offer is is growth we sell growth of of, of businesses and so despite the unique uh, conditions the world is facing uh, over uh, over 2020 really what people wanted to do was get on and, 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 and buy and, and, and grow. And so what we found was that a lot of businesses did you know, pause their activity with us or they weren't able to trade, but very, very quickly they were able to innovate. So lots and lots of businesses 
very quickly moved to a work from home model uh, for their call centers. Uh, lots of businesses were able to uh, uh, transition as Arthur, you said in your presentation from a field sales model to an inside sales model. Uh, and and uh, the kind of difficult conditions created innovation for products as well. So lots of people uh, suddenly were pivoting their businesses, offering different types of services, moving more online, um, restaurants moving to takeaways, these sorts of things uh, we, we, we saw a lot of. But as the uh, markets have grown uh, um, uh, in, in confidence and, and, and started to open up across Europe and, and America, uh, we've seen, you know, really, really strong growth. And I think that what we expect over the next kind of 12 months is almost, well, what we're hoping for over the next 12 months is, is, a, is a big correction. So all of the unspent dollars and unachieved growth of 2020, I think people will be looking to capitalise uh, and have a, and, 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 and go back with a bang and, and, and really try and uh, uh, recover some of those lost opportunities over the next 12 years. So, um, we're, we're trading uh, well at the moment. There are some areas, that, you know, where, there, where we believe that there's pent up demand and, and, and more to come. And I think that once we start to feel more normal, uh, particularly in the UK, as the vaccination process uh, comes to, uh, towards, uh, uh, you know, its completion, we are expecting a kind of a big, a big, a big boom in, in online spending and, and consumer and business demand. Excellent, Steve. Yes, uh, similar feelings. The um, you know the beginning of the pandemic, I think everyone had a, a real feeling of uh, fear and anxiety, and we saw just a lot of caution across the board. I mean, on our platform, we saw saw the volumes uh, at the very beginning either drop uh, really across the board, and uh, I think that everyone just was kind of pulling back on budgets because they didn't know what was going to happen. But then after that, after that initial dip, uh, things. We're, we're pretty strong the rest of the year. And if you look at it on aggregate, uh, really great growth last year. So really, it ended up being a really strong year, surprisingly strong year uh, across the board. But if you just look at that, that overall growth, it doesn't really tell the whole story. And what's fascinating is that while the lead gen industry did really well, you know, we were only as strong as the industries that we service, that we, that we help grow. And when you look at all those individual industry categories, very different stories across the board. I mean, you had some that were just doing fantastic, like amazing growth, had more awash with leads, more leads than they knew what to do with. Uh, then you had others that were just really suffering, right? Uh, the, the obvious ones that uh, some Daniel mentioned, you know, uh, brick and mortar retailers, restaurants, travel, you know, movies, whatever. They, there's a, a lot of industries that were, were really suffering. But uh, fortunately for, for us, for the Legion industry, overall, the, um, the growth was, was strong and it's uh, continued to be really strong, and we uh, predicted to, to to continue uh, going forward. I think, you know, if you look at um, you know taking a step back outside of the pandemic, there's just a lot of tailwinds for the the lead gen industry overall, and I think the pandemic accelerated some of those overall trends. Exactly, this is what uh, I tried to cover during the during the session, but uh, a lot of uh, tailwind is a good uh, English expression. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> if we get it in, uh, a little more into the details, um, Daniel, do you see, can you, can you be a little more you know, industry or category specific and uh, share with us what you, you see as far as growth, uh, you know, which uh, industry or, or categories are leading the growth uh, right now? Um, I'd say that... Um kind of the, the, the industries I mean, we, um, and categories that we've seen a lot of growth come from tend to have been, um, I'd say the, probably the biggest way of categorizing the ones doing well is, 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 is uh, SaaS software products, basically. You know, a lot of people have had to, you know, digitize their entire operation, whether that's, you know, looking for, you know, new video conferencing software, whether that's looking for you know, new ways to take uh, payments uh, online or, or whether that's you know, creating a more robust uh, and functional web presence uh, for, for, for their business. Those are definitely the areas that I think that you know, saw the sort of boom uh, uh, over the last sort of 12 months or so. But actually, you know, that, that kind of thing's leveled off. And I think what's happening now is those businesses are preparing to go back to 
business, how you know, kind of pre twenty twenty version of their of, of, of their business, and now we're seeing a more general growth from 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 across the board. So I think that one area where we saw uh, uh, hesitancy in, in budgets and, and, and in user intent was certainly in sort of consumer spending. You know, if you were, um, uh, you know, less like if you're unsure about your own position or your finances, you're much less likely to make kind of a high end consumer purchase. And, yeah. as, and I think that as we get back to normality, those kind of uh, uh, that kind of consumer driven activity is going to uh, to pick up again. To, uh, certainly. Yeah. So B2B softwares, um, consumer based uh, uh, products and services. I, I shared you know, online in you during the presentation. Uh, Steve, do you agree? Do you see a yeah. difference uh, on your end? Yeah. And, and by the way, great content in that uh, presentation. Really, really, okay. really good stuff. The, uh, and I, I agree. The uh, home services, for us, what we're seeing, there's a tremendous amount of growth in home services and insurance. Uh, this past year, I think we can all identify with why uh, home services you know, grew. We've all been locked in our homes for a year. So uh, everyone is contemplating those home improvement projects. And, and we saw that that reflected in the data. A lot, lot, of, lot of growth there, a um, lot of demand. And, uh, but, but even in home services, we, it, it was interesting because you had uh, you know, some companies that, that offered more of a DIY model or the touchless sales did, did a lot better than the folks that were uh, kind of dependent on a, on a person to person sale or, or the folks that had to get into the house. So some of those companies, yeah. you know, had, had some more challenges or had to, had to adapt. That's uh, a great transition to my next question, uh, Steve. Uh, what did your clients have to change to, you know, to face this new environment? Could you provide a, a few examples there, precise examples? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mentioned that there was a, a bit of a dip at the, at the very beginning and because people were uh, inserting some caution, but part of it too is there's a lot of transition going on. So a lot of our clients use call centers to make outbound calls to the to the leads that they acquire, and a lot of these are, are large physical call centers. You know, like the worst thing you can have during a pandemic, or you know, 500 people all crammed in one room uh, talking loudly on phone. So they, they had to quickly shut those down and transition to virtual call centers. And so I think that that created a, a bit of a pause in people's activities, but I was really impressed. You know, a lot of uh, customers were able to make that transition really quickly. And um, you know, you, you mentioned the, the Quinn Street uh, stock chart. You know, if you look at the, a couple others that are really interesting to check out is the um, Five Nine uh, experienced a tremendous amount of growth. Also Twilio. I mean, their their charts were had uh, were just amazing for the last twelve months. And uh, so that that was a big trend. I think uh, some others were, or another one I'll, I'll mention is we had some uh, buyers that um, really got a lot more sophisticated with uh, how they would accept leads and their filtering criteria. So especially if you're a company that's awash with leads, you can be a little pickier, right? And so uh, they, 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 would, uh, they had to be a little more selective about the, the leads that they would, uh, they would accept and, and go into their process. And, and we, had, we had one home security company, I thought this was interesting that, um, they would look at the states where there is a quarantine in effect and put in filters to block leads from those uh, states because they couldn't they couldn't get in to service those homes anyway. So they would, they would adjust the purchasing criteria uh, in some really novel ways like that. Yeah, and actually I can share a, a fun fact here. We work with uh, one of the largest in you know, a walking tub uh, company here in the U.S. And uh, during the pandemic, we had a meeting, you know, basically every two weeks, and we decided to, uh, during that meeting to pause some states and uh, reactivate other states, you yeah. know, depending on the on the the pandemic uh, there. Because you know, when you're trying to sell a product to um, people 60, 70 years old uh, and over, uh, and when you have to send someone to their home during a pandemic, it's pretty challenging. So yes. we, we did this. Uh, so when, when the East Coast was really badly hit at first, we, we paused everything and we focused on the West Coast. And then we paused the West Coast and reactivate the East Coast and, and then focused on the, 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 mid, the mid, mid, Midwest, sorry. That was, uh, that requ re requested a lot of uh, agility, but it was, uh, was, it was a little fun, yeah, to, to deal yeah, with. Yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah, Daniel? As yeah. So, I mean, well, well. First of all, um, we 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 uh, we have a call center um, in uh, in central London, which we immediately pivoted to a virtual call center, which was 
which was interesting because we talked about doing it for years um, and sort of um, had been putting it off uh, from a kind of thinking the planning would be really onerous, but actually we just sent everybody home. And a week later, it turned out that everything was fine. <laughs> we, should have, um, we, shouldn't have, uh, we shouldn't have been so hesitant um, before, but you know, we saw lots of um, innovation from our, from our clients. So we have home security clients as well who um, started doing um, home uh, surveys on Zoom. So they're literally FaceTiming the, the prospects uh, from iPhones and sort of showing where the security cameras could potentially be and, 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 and this sort of thing. So they were able to do the sale and then put a, you know, a later installation date uh, uh, in, in, into the diary down the line. And I think, I, think, I think what we experienced as well is generally a bit less intent. So, you know, as I mentioned before, MVF is very, very keen on monitoring outcomes from, from our leads and, and using that data to uh, optimize our marketing. And what we noticed was that in generally speaking, generally speaking, close, close rates were, were down, you know, versus where they were um, uh, in, in 2019, certainly. Um, and in, you know, January 2020 was a really, really big month for MVF. And we had a lot of great results from, from, from our campaigns on, on, on the client side. And so we were seeing these close rates dropping. So what we were able to do is to um, manipulate our messaging and our, our channel mix to create lower numbers of higher intent leads. And that enabled a lot of our clients to, to, to stay live when otherwise they might have had to uh, a pause. At least we could keep, you know, smaller, smaller uh, number of higher criteria leads, as, as you say, Steve, like going through. Uh, in order to keep them uh, profitable and keep keep the lead flow still being worthwhile. All right. <clears throat> and uh, when looking at your own operations, what did you have to change? I'm going to be on that one. The um, yeah, for us, it was a, there was a lot of transition. It was a, a interesting year for sure. But the uh, I think the biggest one was transitioning to a remote working environment. So we um, actually uh, moved out of our office, uh, went almost completely remote, and we still are remote uh, to this day. And um, that was a big challenge, transition to Slack and Zoom, uh, lifesavers for our company uh, to allow us to, to really work efficiently. So fortunately, uh, you know, that all went very well. We were, uh, we had some pretty aggressive growth targets for the year, and we were nervous about, you um, the inability for to have any business travel. We service a lot of larger companies. We like to have face-to-face -face meetings with them. And uh, so we you know, shut down all of our, our business travel at the beginning of the year. And um, that, it actually, things, things worked out fine. You know, we were able to conduct our meetings via Zoom and uh, we're able to still hit our numbers for the year and had really strong growth. So it all, it all worked out okay, but uh, definitely a little nerve wracking for sure. So work from home. Yep. What about you, Daniel? Yeah, I think, um, uh, you know, one of the things we realized early on was that we were, you know, we were able to keep the meetings going, we were able to communicate really easily. As a business, we were already using Slack and we were in, you know, we we're in multiple countries, so we're used to kind of Zoom meetings and things like that. But I think um, MVF is a business that employs a lot of young uh, graduates. We, we, we take sort of entrepreneurial graduates from uh, great universities and we, um, uh, you know, we train them and we have, you know, it's quite a, a buzzy kind of collaborative atmosphere. And that's by design, you know, we, we sort of believe that we, we, can, we can help our clients grow most effectively when we've got collaborative groups of salespeople, marketers, page designers, um, operations all sat together trying to solve uh, for client growth in a collective kind of cross-functional way. Um, and obviously they can't sit next to each other anymore because they're all sat in their own bedrooms. And so that was probably trying to create that uh, cross-functional collaboration uh, was a challenge and also trying to make it quite a fun uh, environment to work in as well is, is, is challenging. So you know, we, 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 we had quite a lot of kind of Friday afternoons on Hangouts, um, uh, doing quizzes 
or doing um, sort of uh, competitions uh, 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 or knowledge sharing, you know, th th that sort of thing. So we were desperately trying to sort of recreate that kind of uh, vibrant atmosphere mm -hmm. online, which, which, which we managed. But I think now that we've opened our offices again and we're actually doing it for real, I think we're realizing now just how much we've missed of, 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 of actually being in the same space. And um, it's, a, you know, I think, I, think it's, uh, I think it's human nature when, when the lockdown starts to sort of look for all of the things that are working well from home and, and, and not pay attention to the things that aren't working well. And now, now we're back in the office, they all seem really obvious, like, of course this isn't right. We have, we've been sat in our bedrooms for a year, you know, that we... <laughs> It was just it's easy to be blind to that kind of thing but you know i'm glad that the way we're going to move forward is it's sort of a hybrid of the both because there are times um when working from home is incredibly advantageous yeah. you know work or or you know it's and, and and i think we've all got a different attitude to to towards working from home and, and as we move forward we're going to have a, a hybrid uh working from home uh uh kind of policy that we're that we're kind of working on yeah. We're, we're going to do the same as well. We're in a hybrid approach now. And uh, we kept a small office, but looking for a bigger one again now as, as we speak. So I think that's going to be a, probably a pretty com, common model for a lot of folks. Excellent. Same here. Implementing the same changes uh, with, uh, with Boudin. Great. All right, uh, Michael. Do we have any any questions from the audience? Yeah, yeah, uh, but we do. We, we do have a couple questions, and and thanks, gentlemen, for for going through this stuff. This is great. Um, this question, I think, is is for Daniel and and Arthur. Um, you know, you both sort of mentioned um, the a uh, boost in 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 revenue or or an increase in demand for lead gen or new clients. And sort of a shift from maybe some of the traditional uh, marketing taxes going towards digital and lead gen due to the pandemic. Um, and if that's categorized incorrectly, please please correct me. But do you, if if that is categorized correctly, um, do you think that there may be an actual retraction as things start to sort of get back to um, quote unquote normal? And that those budgets may shift back into different, more traditional. Um, categories, or is this uh, for using another uh, uh, word, the new normal, uh, and we'll continue to see, you know, um, an increase in trend and demand in, in sort of digital and lead gen? Yeah, that was uh, <clears throat> the the main question we had when working on the 2021 forecast. You know, at the end of the year, what what numbers should we place there? Uh, we're going to face another lockdown in some countries, whatever. It was very hard to try try and predict the future. Uh, what, what is sure is that you know some budget will go back to where they, they, they were before, at least part of it. Um, you know that that's obvious. But what we think is that the the, the growth with uh, the digital um, uh, digital marketing trends that I shared uh, previously with you guys will probably compensate for that part of the budget that that could basically slip out of our fingers in the future. So I really believe that uh, there is no concerns as far as growth to slow down and get back to what it was before. I really think that the growth would be will be higher than than pre pandemic as a, you know, as a whole. Uh, then when you look into some categories specifically, you might find something different. But uh, looking at the lead gen industry as a whole, I think that's the, the trend. What do you think, Daniel? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm inclined to agree. Now, I, you know, I, I think um, what was really interesting, Arthur, in, you, in the early slides of your presentation was where um, you were attempting to um, uh, kind of put a size on the on on on, on the lead gen spend industry, because it's interesting because it's something we've tried to do as well, and it's 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 obviously very difficult. And I think one of the reasons why it's difficult is because if your lead generation is working correctly, then you're supplying um, a profitable source of incremental sales for a business. And really, there should be no limit to the budget of a business, you know, in, 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 in that context. And so it's not a zero sum game. You know, it's not that there is an X amount that businesses have to spend, because if you're growing the business, the business will always have more to spend uh, uh, in, in kind of answer to that growth. So I, I think where where people have shifted online or 
spent are now spending unspent budgets online i think it's going to be very difficult for them to go you know if if they're now essentially trading trading at a higher level they're not going to choose to trade at a smaller level so where it's successful i don't think it will, it will, it will the, the the budgets will get smaller again where where it will get they'll get smaller again is where those businesses have more traditional channels open to them that are more profitable uh, than, than than online so you know walk-ins from a, from a bricks and mortar shop weren't there you know now they will be there so you know signage or in-store discounts might might be uh kind of uh, uh more you know more profitable for them but then again it's it's not a zero-sum game so really if they're if they're if they're uh, uh performing at a higher level from their digital acquisition why not just add both parts to the to the budget and, and, and experience higher growth overall Steve, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to the, the, the cycle of lead gen and what we're talking about here before I go on to the next question, but give you a chance. Yeah, I, I think they, uh, they, they covered it uh, pretty well. I'm very optimistic about uh, things moving forward. I think you think about the acceleration of the, of the trend of digital transformation. A lot of people uh, are hesitant to change and a crisis is a time to really force change. And so I think a lot of people during this pandemic, they, they were forced to adopt some new methods and they found that, hey, it's pretty good. They like it, right? They, they can uh, live their life uh, more on, online. And so, uh, yeah, so we're, we're seeing the same thing and uh, right. overall, very so this is So this is the new normal. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, one last question and then uh, we'll wrap it up. And this is a, a little bit off, but um, one of the questions was keen on your, um, Daniel, your, your comment about how you optimized uh, for certain clients by um, focusing on higher intent leads. And the question is, how did you, how did you guys sort of manage through that? Because usually higher intent leads also means more expensive marketing costs sometimes. So uh, obviously maybe that was just a, a, a you know, a, an adjustment you made for a, a single client or whatever, but how do you, how did you sort of manage through the high intent, high, generally high cost leads to, to, to adjust that? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, part, part of the, I mentioned when I was introducing MBF before that what we what we do is what we what we call smarter customer generation. And so generally what that means is we, we're optimizing our clients' close rates as as the growth lever. So if I can uh, uh, if I can take you from a five percent close rate to a six percent close rate, your cost per onboard goes down. Now what we normally do here at MBF is we then normally say, okay, right, well, if your cost per onboard is going down. Uh, and it's below where it needs to be, you can afford to pay me more per lead, which I'll then reinvest in volume. And this, this, this process of continual campaign optimization means that most of our biggest clients grow on average between kind of, you know, 20, 25% a year with us. So we're constantly optimizing and growing and optimizing and growing. So what that means is what we were able to do in that pandem pandemic time is, is sort of reverse that process and say, okay, uh, you know, those leads that we're going to send you are more expensive, but we're going to send you fewer leads overall, you know, uh, in, in order to keep you alive. And so by, by kind of reverse engineering that, that smart customer generation process, we're able to deliver higher leads, uh, higher intent leads at a lower volume for, for similar types of margins that, that, that we were experiencing before, if that makes sense. It does make sense. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds... Uh, relative from a, my, my, my buyer um, mind, so, it sounds scary uh, from a buyer perspective, um, but it does work, right? It's math and it's, and it's predictable um, analytics that you put plug in and it, it works. Um, but yeah, cause, cause that also sounds my, you know, my lead buyer yeah. brain also gets scared of going, oh, you're just going to charge me more, but I won't see the results, yeah. you know, that sort of thing. I'd like to I mean, comment on, on that real quick. Uh, I actually wrote a lot about this in, on my LinkedIn profile. There are a few articles covering this, but there is a, a math equation <clears throat> for the lead gen, which is, you know, the target customer acquisition cost, the, the amount of money a brand is actually willing to pay for a, for a customer, a new customer, let's say $1,000, is equal to the price per lead divided by the sales rate. So if you can improve the sales rate over time, can actually increase the price per lead over time without changing the outcome, which is the customer acquisition cost. So targeting higher intent leads 
has a higher comes with a higher cost. But if you can charge more the end client because you're delivering a better quality and a higher sales rate, then it works. It, it is working at scale. Yep. Yep. And, and just to add to that real quick, Arthur's formula, which is great, is just looking at the media cost. You also have to think about your operational costs as well. So if you can be more efficient with fewer leads, you're going to have lower operational costs as well. It's a great right. point. Yeah. That's a great point. And, and this could probably be its own session talking about this. Um, and there's probably a needed one too, because the transparency behind it, like I was just saying, my, my, my lead buyer brain is thinking surface level things, not, not really diving into um, how this really works from a mechanical standpoint. Um, but we'll leave it at that for this session. Um, I appreciate you uh, three for joining and it's a uh, really great information and and, uh, you know, I'm excited uh, to hear this information and excited to see the lead gen industry continue to grow, and especially all three of your companies continue to grow as well. So we'll leave it at that. If anybody has any uh, additional questions or maybe you're watching this on a recorded uh, video, um, feel free to um, connect with any of these three gentlemen uh, and uh, or myself, and I can put you in touch with them uh, as well. So we'll leave it at that. Thank you guys very much and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.